Well, welcome to the Energizing America podcast, where we talk all things energy and why we need it in our business and lives and communities. Got John and Benjamin sitting with us, and we're going to talk about the dirt world people and people in blue collar. So thanks for coming, Benjamin. Appreciate it. Pleasure to be here. And John, you again. You thanks, again. thanks for the invite. Can't keep me away. <laughs> no, we've tried. Like a bad dad joke, I just keep showing up, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> what's, gets... what's a dad joke to start us off with, Benjamin? Well, the... Why is it so hard for people in Athens to get up in the morning? I don't know. It's because Don is tough on Greece. <laughs> wow. There you go. That's I even one. have to laugh at it. I must be a dad by default because <laughs> yep. it's kind of funny. Congrats. Well, or <laughs> yeah, you're a grandpa, actually. Well, so you're there both. is that, too. And I think you mentioned on our last podcast we did together about sometimes jokes are so bad they turn into grandpa jokes, not even dad jokes, right? It's like another So level. Benjamin, build with, and you're working with all these cool people in the dirt world. What is a dirt guy? So... You might have to clarify a little more. What is a dirt guy? Who, what is a dirt you? gal? Who are these people that you're going out and taking pictures of and recording videos? And I mean, you're supposed yeah. to be a movie star if you're on camera, right? Yeah, not true. Uh, what we're trying to do is spotlight everyone in the dirt world. And for folks listening to this, uh, I'm going to say dirt world because it's my habit. All of these principles apply across blue collar. It doesn't matter what trade or or vertical or industry you're in. I think these principles that we'll likely talk about today, they 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 apply 100% across our worlds. So uh, just a qualifier. Dirt people, uh, they, they're operators, they're laborers, they're grade checkers, they're foremen, site superintendents, estimators, project managers, owners, people who move dirt, for a living, people who mine things, um, people who demolish buildings, people who blow stuff up, like those are dirt people. And, and what what do they represent? Who's behind them? Are these college educated Harvard graduates? Are they, who are they? Somehow I feel like you know the answer. <laughs> it's like, uh, this is what we call a leading question. Yeah, this yeah. is a leading yep. question. I, yeah. I want our audience, because I have my opinion about what the dirt people are. They're the kind of folks who show up at my house, charge me $20,000, take six months to get an invoice, and are some of the coolest people ever as long as you can tackle them and actually get them for five minutes because usually they're too busy operating their equipment. But I don't know. I have a very narrow opinion about dirt people. Sure, sure. Yeah. They're, they're hardworking Americans. We're, it's it's blue collar. Dirt people are blue collar people. You had Riley Sassy on here uh, a couple weeks ago or whenever. Uh, his people, people who like America, people who like building things with their hands, people who likely grew up in the industry, had a dad, had a grandpa, had a great grandpa who moved dirt for a living. That's that's who these people are. They're salt of the earth. Is that what your opinion was, John, on dirt people? My opinion on dirt people is, is like Benjamin said, it is a lot of, there's, there's this intangible thing about blue collar work that just for a little bit of a backstory, I guess I'll back up one step. I spent the first 28 years of my working career as a blue collar guy. My arms are full of, you know, welding burns and I'm the guy that made stuff. And there's nothing quite as satisfying as at the end of the day, you can say, Look at this. I made this. It's evident to everybody. Everybody sees it. Now I come, come home from work. My wife's like, so what'd you do today? Talk to people? <laughs> no, but seriously, what'd you do today? <laughs> yeah, well, I talk to people. So to me, that's what's so cool about the dirt world and the blue collar world as they're the people that get to make stuff and do stuff. And you can't replace that with anything else. It's just a really cool vibe of people. Almost to the point, guys, where it's a little bit challenging. If you come from a blue-collar background and you end up in leadership, which involves oftentimes talking to people more than doing anything, it can kind of tweak you a little bit. Because sure. to your point, your wife will say, what did you do? Or my kids have gotten into this habit like, oh, the last place I'm going to work is Westcom because I am not going to do what you do for a living. And I've tried to coach them like, no, you don't have to be a CEO who sits in meetings. You can actually do something better. You can be an electrician out in the field, right? But when they look 
into that, they're like, wow, that's a crazy world. Because you come home at dinner, you you haven't done anything. Every time we ask you, you say, well, I don't know. I just kind of showed up at work <laughs> and did things. And then sometimes I think my team's probably ready to fire me. So when you think about this, Benjamin, these are hardworking folks. They're American people. Do they believe in people? Is that part of the piece in order to fit in the blue collar world? Or do you got to believe in yourself? What, what What's driving them every day? I, I was thinking about this, uh, John, your, your comment made me think about it. Um, we, we've talked about mission and the importance of mission. And what I've seen and what I've lived and what I've seen across the, the dirt world is that people want to be on a mission. People want to be part of something. Now, I think you, could, you can take that too far, make it way too fluffy and whatever. But let's just imagine. So, for example, uh, just last week, I saw something came up from a company we work with, one of our partners, C.W. Matthews. And in 2017, I want to say it was, might be wrong on my dates, but at any rate, in Atlanta, where they're based, there was a bridge collapse and this, uh, or like an overpass, this whole overpass collapsed. You can look, look it up. It's a crazy story. And it was in like 47 days or 49 days or something. C.W. Matthews came in, demoed the, the old stuff and replaced the overpass in like 47 days or something. And it was like, thumbs up, yo. Like, here's a thoroughfare right through Atlanta. It was completely screwing up traffic, like in a bad way. And that team came in and was on a mission to complete that project timely. I'm sure they had budgets, this sort of thing. But the, the key was, is that it was critical infrastructure. And so when I think about the importance or what people want to be a part of or why what drives them i see i look at it let's say there was 200 people working on that project i have no idea it could be a thousand could be 20 it doesn't matter but the people on that project they're there for a reason they're there it's like i'm not just demoing concrete i'm i'm replacing this overpass to get traffic flowing again so people can go about their lives and that is true whether you're replacing overpasses you're paving roads you're or you're wiring uh, all the stuff that you guys wire on on uh, wells across the country. Like that's critical infrastructure that we need to live our lives. And that to me, that's a that's a mission. That's we're doing something here. We're not just doing this for no reason. Like people depend on this. People's lives depend on. Kind of like the word impact comes to mind, right? People like to have a, an impact in a positive way. And so I think sometimes like doctor, right? Like, you know, the impact you're saving lives or an EMT, you're saving lives, right? We rarely correlate blue collar work as equaling impact, right? But I think during COVID, many of us saw what happens without a blue collar workforce. Mm -hmm. It's not real pleasant when your UPS driver doesn't bring your Amazon down the driveway, right? Like, mm -hmm. this is a real thing. These blue collar workers, we absolutely need them all over the place. What about you? What comes to mind? For sure, I, I agree 100% with what Benjamin just said. To me, the, and it's not for everybody, but if you have a guy that goes out and installs garage doors, that's fine. He can install garage doors. Maybe he's happy, maybe he's not. But if there's some bigger mission that he thinks about that gets him out of bed in the morning, that he's not just putting a garage door up, but he's, he's making someone's home more comfortable, He's protecting it. Like whatever the, whatever the mission is to do, it's a bigger picture thing. And, you know, I've told you this story before, but I was driving by Westcom shop and there was a banner out front during COVID. And it said, Brave and Bold, Energizing America. And as I drove by, I read that and I thought, that would get me out of bed in the morning. That would do it. There, there's a bigger mission. And I don't. I had no idea even what Westcom did, like behind the scenes, but I bought into the mission. So I think in the blue collar world, maybe that's been lost a little bit. Like, and you know, there's this pie in the sky and this fluff and all that, that things. But I, I really believe that the mission, like you, we've all mentioned earlier that, you attract the right people for the right job with the right mission. doesn't mean you attract everybody, 
but you attract who you're trying to attract with the right mission. So we, we did a tour with a cement company yesterday and the guy that's been there for 40 years, when we're on the top of the, uh, whatever you call it, we're near the belt, we're way up. I felt like we we're really high in the air. I'm not sure how high we were. I just know that you had to walk backwards down the stair to get back to the ground, right? So anyways, he's telling me like, Shane, you have to understand this right here, when I see a bridge getting poured or I drive by a school or I drive by the local church and they're pouring concrete, I know that they couldn't do that without us unloading that ship. And so when it's 40 below, which happens here, and we're trying to move product through this facility, he said, that's actually on my mind. And so the reason why we we're talking about this is he's had a lot of challenge and their company's been bought and sold and bought and sold. And he said, every time it's bought and sold, it feels like we have to be more fluffy and we have to be better. And the next generation, we have to highlight them. And he said, I'm just having a really hard time embracing this mentality. And so I was telling him that, you know what, actually, you just never had anyone tell you, you figured it out on your own, but you've always believed in that mission. We just have to do a better job today telling people what that mission is. Everyone's always had it in the blue collar workforce. I, I just don't think it's been talked about, right? Every excavator that you probably meet with, if they were building houses, or their mission was to get that person in that house so that they could get out of their in-laws or whatever they're doing, right? That, that's always been there. It just was never highlighted until today when we're looking back and we're saying, whoops, we forgot to explain the mission. And that, that might be why we're in a work shortage. Could very right? well be. The, the doctors, they never, my whole life, EMTs, firefighters, you know, save the world, save people, right? And, and they do a great job at that. That's that's how they attract people to go into college for eight years. They've they've explained what the mission is. And I think that's hugely important for us to do as we go forward. How are we doing with people when you're out in the field, Benjamin, and your team is doing shoots with people, taking videos of them? Is the industry, the people in the industry, are they embracing this idea? Obviously, the companies you're working with are, right? But what about the people behind the bulldozer? Uh, first of all, you shouldn't be behind the bulldozer. Just a safety. That's tip. right. You should be. <laughs> second of all, it. I'm sorry, Ben. Second of all, uh, it's <laughs> not as easy as you might think uh, to get some some 30 year operator veteran to hop out of the cab and do a four minute interview on camera. It's not as easy as you might think. It's tough, and our field guys, uh, our, our teams that fly out and do these videos and these photo shoots, get everybody's headshot. Like they have half their job is getting the people to agree to take, you know, take the time out and, and get on camera. It's uncomfortable, you know, it's hard for people, especially if they're not used to getting, they're in the spotlight and they're not used to it. Do, you, do they ever have to deceive them in order to make it happen? Like I, <laughs> I want to do a podcast with a particular member on our team and I've, I've, I keep trying to deceive them like, hey, Tyler, uh, tomorrow at 930, we got to go check out a job together. And he's like, Call him bluff. It doesn't happen, Shane. You're never going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> or the, he doesn't call bluff. They call cap. That's what they do nowadays. Call him cap on that. Whatever. So that's a big uh, thing for your team to try and get these guys out of the cab. Yep. But it does happen. And I think uh, a lot of that is how you set it up as well. Like, and they've learned. I don't know how to do this stuff, but that's why we have them. They, they've learned how to set it up well, work with company, you know, the company leadership to be like, Hey, these guys are going to come out and help them out. Take, you know, be good with taking photos and whatever you, you see some of the stuff online. Obviously they, they pull it off. Sometimes they, uh, most of the time they can find some people to, to work with, but it's, uh, yeah, it's a little uncomfortable being on camera. Well, part of it too, is that the dirt world has some older folks in it. Right. And th they're still maybe need some encouragement sure. about this new workforce. In fact, when we had a discussion at lunch yesterday, I was telling this individual from the cement company, I have to keep talking about him, but I was like, how many times do you think growing up, you heard the same conversation amongst your dad and his coworkers about how the new generation doesn't, right? The new generation never works as hard as we do. And it's been that way probably for 200 years. I don't know. <laughs> yep. But th that's a common thing, right? So why are we doing this? Do we find that same thing in Westcom and the blue collar workers? They kind of have a hard time highlighting well we have a lot of we, we have a lot of conversation about it doesn't really matter what i think you know i came up in a different world where jobs 
we're fairly plentiful, but not like today. And if you didn't want to work there, they'd say, well, go find someplace else to work. Today, we don't have the luxury of, yeah, go find some place else to work and we'll find somebody else and plug you in tomorrow, right? So I think we, we do it for two different reasons. Number one, that's not who we are. Like, if it's better for Benjamin to go work somewhere else and we legitimately care about Benjamin, then let's help Benjamin go work somewhere else. But if it's not better for Benjamin, if we can help him be a better person, thereby a better employee at Westcom, let's help him. Right? So again, it just to me, it goes back to the people. What's best for that person? And I have to coach myself a lot. And there's, you know, uh, uh, some coworkers that are around in my generation. And a lot of times we go talk and we vent a little bit and then, okay, yeah, it doesn't really matter how we feel and what we think. It's a little bit irrelevant. It's some experience, but it doesn't matter. It just tells us we got to do what we got to do. There's and, the, the and and the mission is too important not to embrace exactly. it. Exactly. The, the 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 worker shortage that we're all experiencing, it's it's too severe to let your ego or your ideas or your experience or whatever it is take precedence over what the real need is. The real need is to get out there, explain your mission, get people excited to be to be a blue collar worker again, and and to highlight what they're doing and be sincere about it too. By the way, right? Uh, have you guys ran into fakes, Benjamin? Are there fakes in your world? Uh, not on, uh, no. I mean, there's pr there's probably some that I don't know about, but but far and away, like it's way more often that people are just they would rather just do their job than be on camera. I'm just doing my job, like I've been doing right. for thirty years. Leave me alone, right? Like then some kind of macho bravado f fakeness, like that just really doesn't happen. I, it doesn't seem like those folks survive in the blue collar. World. <laughs> they have a no. way of getting rooted out really quickly, <laughs> right? Like, uh, Shane, I don't know where you found this guy, but ego out, you yep. know, yep. They, they, they don't put up with it. Yeah. So when you talk about build wit and, and customer success, that's your team, right? Customer success. Yep. How do, how do these principles of understanding who's behind the dirt world? How does that help your team? Do you guys have to marry that? Do you have to uh, talk about these people? To totally. We, well, more importantly, we have to talk with these people. Yeah. These are our okay, customers, not just and it's about them. right, right, okay. right. These are our customers, and it's our responsibility to make sure they're treated super well. Uh, we meet them where they are, meet them on their terms. Actually, something uh, I told you about my magic little black notebook that I carry everywhere. Uh, something I've been writing in uh, about lately and trying to think through is how do I get my team on site more? Um, just before this podcast, I I went out. Uh, went out on site for, I mean, it was a quick trip, but went and saw some more folks. You, you just get a whole new perspective when you're not sitting behind a desk, you're there. You got a hard hat on your, your boots are muddy. You're seeing what you're asking questions. Okay. You explain, what are you doing here? How, how does this work? I took, uh, we took our team, um, on site a couple of weeks ago in Nashville. And it was, that was the first time for several of, of them on our team. It blew their minds. We have this whole crushing, our operation they got three or four excavators out there haul trucks dozers and a lot of activity going you know and it's another job site for these guys they are, you know another day another dollar for for our team it just exploded their heads they're like wait so this is what we're trying to do whole new perspective totally get out in the field and check it out yep we yep. talk a lot about that don't we john oh that's how i get energized i go in the office for a week and then i'm like i gotta go out and see the guys I yep. got to go out in the job sites. I got to go. It's literally where you get energy from. Well, and, and what can happen sometimes is if you're sitting in the office and you're trying to figure all this stuff out, this little project you're trying so hard to accomplish, you're getting all caught up in the details and you forgot that there's actually this bigger thing you're trying to reach towards, right? And For so sure. it doesn't even matter what kind of boots you have on. It matters that the trench gets dug and it gets dug safely, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, I think that can just so easily get lost. And when we get out in the field and we work with the guys, we experience a day in their shoes. And especially if you're curious, I've, I've found I'm just a curious guy by nature. So it comes more natural to me. But I like I want to know why you're pulling, why you're digging this trench. Like, why don't you just put conduit or cable tray and follow the 
follow the containment wall if we're on a pad, right? Or yesterday when we're at the concrete place, like, why wouldn't we just, you know, stay above ground and drop here? And, and you get all this information. Turns out blue collar workers love teaching you. They love to teach you. Yeah. They might not love to do it on camera, right? But if you arrive and you're curious, they want to help you. These are some of the friendliest folks I've ever worked with. In Engaged, fact, 100%. Yeah. Our safety director yesterday was with me, and on the way back to the office, he's like, I didn't realize that's the kind of people that work at these places. You know, he came from the federal government. And in the federal government, you kind of move up the ranks by elbows, you know, who's who and who's doing who and all this kind of stuff. It blue collar, it, it, you don't survive that way. You got to have your boots on and you got to go show it. Yep. So on your customer success team, who are the folks that you're looking for to ensure that customers succeed? What are some of the qualities that you're finding are the best in your people? Yeah, we we actually, uh, we just went through a, I'll try to keep this brief. I see this going into a long story. So we see how I do. We just went through a, a, a full day with a, um, a consultant that came in. His name is Rich Divini. Uh, he's a former Navy SEAL trainer. So he was the one that was uh, selecting what Navy SEALs go into the more elite teams and stuff. And so he was responsible to figure out who goes on what team? And so back to your question, we, we just spent the day with him to establish what are the attributes, not the skills, not even the mindsets, but what are those attributes, those innate attributes that we need build with people to have. And so the first answer that came to mind to your, to your question, who do I want on my team? It's people who have a high level of situational awareness. So if you're a clueless goober, and you don't know what's going on around, around you, we're customer facing, we're, we're on the hook. And like you were just saying, blue collar, they'll be like, hey, this guy's a goon. Like, why don't you get him off my job site and we'll get somebody in here who knows what he's talking about. So that doesn't mean people have to know everything, but they have to be aware, situational awareness. Uh, a, a second attribute we identified was courage. Like we have to act in spite of fear. We're, there's many unknowns that, that we have right now that we're up against and we just don't have the answers. We need to still be able to act whether or not we know the answers, trusting we're gonna go get it figured out. And then the last is humility. Again, to, to the earlier point, if you go in with all kinds of bravado, pretending like, oh, I know everything there is to know about a crushing operation. It's like, you will be crushed is what's gonna happen. <laughs> Cause like people can smell it from a mile away. So when I'm, as I'm hiring for our team in customer success, I want people who are on, who are engaged, who can learn quickly, who, who can, they don't have to be blue collar people, but they have to be able to empathize and relate with what the people with the boots on are, are up against and help them be successful. Is it, is it much the same even in our business? We're just looking for a pulse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we've reached that stage where, <laughs> yep. Oh yeah, you're good. You're yeah. hired. <laughs> you're hired. And, and for some reason we have a lot of turnover right. and it's extremely right. expensive. It's not really like that. No, for sure it's not. It's definitely a big thing for us, but it's hard, especially when we're in these times where you need people so bad to remember that piece of the puzzle, that this is a bigger mission with, with more to it than getting Bob out in the field tomorrow, right? On occasion, you do need Bob out in the field tomorrow, and hopefully you can coach him into who you want him to be or help him become who he should be, I should say. But yeah, it's it's uh, something that we need to remind ourselves about. For sure, For and sure. I think and I think it's a constant. We're we're going through an exercise similar to that right now, Benjamin. Actually, we just had our culture meeting the other day and writing down attributes and trying to assign the attribute to the core value that we believe in. Because we've always just had three: accountable, flexible, and urgent. And we're starting to wonder. Okay, I think we need we need to expand on that idea and, and what core value does each one of those attributes line up with mm -hmm. and then do training centered around that core value. And here's some of the mm -hmm. things that help define this core value. So I, I guess what, what I find fascinating about our conversation about blue collar people, in order to be a doctor, you got to go to school for eight years. In order to be a accountant, you got to go to school for four years. In order to be a engineer, there's four years, right? And then there's on the job training that turns, that follows that. But I asked, I started the conversation asking, who are these people? Because what I'm getting at is there's tons of people out there in the real world 
that are tuning in that are saying, what in the world do I do to make my life more energized? What do I need to do to be happier in my career? What do I need to do? Who do I need to become? And it turns out that all they need to do is be true to themselves. And probably they belong in blue collar where there's tons of rewards for what you're doing and you actually get to step back at the end of the day and see what you built, what you dug, what you electrified. These are really, really cool things that could be very fulfilling for people. And guess what? You qualify. If you're listening, you qualify. Absolutely. There's, you, don't, you don't have to prove your skill set in the form of a doctor. You don't got to prove your skill set in the form of a four-year accountant or a four-year engineer. What I just heard you say, Benjamin, in the dirt world, in the blue-collar world, is you need people who are honest, who, who show up, and who want to be dirty, right, in a, in a grand sense. And then there's a bunch of skills and qualities behind that that either you're going to be a foreman or you're going to be a superintendent, an estimator, or a laborer. But either one, whichever one of those four you're going to be, you can be proud of it. And I heard the same thing from you, John, that if you want to be an electrician, you don't have to actually go to school for four years. You can... Come, come as you are. If, if you're hardworking and you're flexible and you're urgent, you're accountable, these different things. And, and guys, we, we are full of a world, especially here in America, that that's what America is. We just forgot to tell those people that they have a place. And the place might be at Westcom. The place might be at Buildwit. Might be at one of the excavating companies that you have mentioned. Doesn't matter. But there's a place for you. And I look forward to seeing those people out on the job site. Hopefully at Westcom, I kind of have a bias, right? <laughs> uh, you and I might have to fight over this, Benjamin. I'm, sh I'm shocked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, th I think that's what's so cool about the conversation about people. When we get behind it, that's who we see. Americans, they have a place. Mm -hmm. So it's our job as leaders of companies to keep highlighting that and keep defining it. I think. I think that's, just, that's super well said. I, I think... There is a level of, maybe the last part you said is the most important. There's a level of responsibility that leadership needs to take. It's our fault that we haven't been shining the light on this. John, you mentioned it earlier. You can go and you can vent with your peers about this and that. At the end of the day, my generation, the youngsters coming up, like they don't really care what you have to say about that. Like They're going to do their thing. So sure. if you want to fix the problem, get after it. You have to take responsibility for this. Nobody is coming to our rescue. And I think that's, that's one of the biggest things that I've been slowly realizing uh, the last year, two years, three, I mean, even pre build -it days. No one's coming to our rescue. I saw something uh, the other day on LinkedIn, something like 5 million, another 5 million people uh, short on the, on the workforce, blue collar workforce. It's like, where are those people gonna come from? Do you really think all these problems are just going to magically vanish? Is there some big button someone can press somewhere? Like it's certainly not in Washington, D.C. Like who's going to press the button to fix this problem? No one's going to press a button. You know who's going to fix it? It's going to be individual people, individual companies. They're going to fix it for their company. And they're, that's going to inspire another company to say, hey, maybe we can fix that for our company too. Individuals are going to fix it for themselves. A kid... We, uh, I just met the other day. He came to our, our open house in Nashville. He, he, he saw one of our excavation partners in Nashville. He saw them online. He's like, what is this company all about? He digs in. I'm going to work for them. He moves from Chicago to Nashville to start working as an operator for this company. He was in the GC world before. Now he's an operator. That company is fixing it on the individual level. They're fixing it for them. Ownership, accountability. We worked with Jocko. I mentioned Jocko earlier. He wrote the book, Extreme Ownership. If you haven't uh, read that book, shut this podcast off. Go buy that book. Listen to the book. Don't it's listen to me. Book. It will change your life because you will realize you don't need to complain about millennials. You don't need to complain about Gen Z. What you need to do is take accountability and figure out how to meet these people where they are. And then you can actually have a shot at fixing the problem. So accountability, uh, it's, it's personal responsibility, man. It and really is. I think we can fix it. Oh, I, I, I'm confident we can. I think we're we going to give it a try. Yeah. If nothing else, we'll fail trying. Great conversation, you guys. I look forward to more conversation about people. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it.